promote the freedom of information and open exchange of ideas. So whether or not you agree with everything you hear in the session or even the books on our shelves, we want you to have wide access to different perspectives so that you can learn and grow and we can learn and grow from each other. So I'll ask that you keep that in mind as we have our discussion today. At the end of this, I'll ask you to fill out a brief survey, ask me what you'd like to see in the future, how today went, so that we can keep this series relevant to you all. You'll notice some books up here that are available for checkout, and if you're doing a project, I see people taking notes, or you're doing this for class and you want to learn more about the topic, come talk to me or one of the librarians at the reference desk. We're happy to help you find other materials. So next week, no, in two weeks, Sharon Spence Wilcox will be leading a session on mindfulness and social justice. But today, please join me in welcoming David Gillespie, programmer, activist, artist, and musician, as we discuss privacy and cybersecurity in the digital age. David. Uh, thank you for having me so much, Sarah uh, Central. Uh, I'm David Gillespie. I work at a company that's just across the street, right up above the Blick uh, Art Supply Store. Uh, called Substantial, uh, we're a digital product studio, so we're always building um, apps and websites for different companies and clients, and so we always, you know, thinking about how to build things securely in ways that protect privacy. Um, and I first gave a version of this talk uh, about a year ago, shortly after the uh, presidential election of last year, um, and I think that it's just as relevant today, uh, and if not more so. Um, so, I, this is where, yeah. So, first thing is, why should people care about their about their online uh, privacy and security? You know, it's like I'm, I'm just a dude. I'm not like Mark Zuckerberg. I'm not, you know, president. I'm not somebody that, you know, if I got hacked, I would be worth billions of dollars. But uh, chances are, you know, your your data has already been hacked. Your data is already out there. Um, and in fact, that you know, it, every year more and more data of your data is out there. Um, and it kind of expands uh, uh, at an accelerating rate year after year. Uh, you can go to this website, haveibeenpwned.com, it's the hacker spelling, uh, P-W-N, and uh, you can put in just your, you know, one of your common usernames or your email address, and that will tell you if your data has been leaked in a data breach. And uh, I think over half of internet users' data has been leaked in internet breaches uh, recently. This is just one way that your data can get out there and be, be used maliciously. Uh, and then once somebody has your data, we, you know, we can talk about what happens there, but uh, a, a lot of things can happen between identity theft, uh, blackmail, um, uh, different kinds of exploitation, hacking, taking over your devices. There's all kinds of things that, that could happen, go wrong, that you may not even know about uh, until much later. Um, so. This talk is for you. It's not a technical talk. I'm not going to talk about uh, how to build secure software. I'm not going to go into details about uh, cryptography or uh, how to secure a large business, if you might, you know, which is a whole profession of like how to how to lock down companies. Yeah, no, this is this is for everyday people who have digital devices. You you know, most of us at this point we have smartphones, we have laptops, we have social media, we have an online presence, and uh, we all need to be aware of the ways we're exposed and the risks that we're taking by using those things and what we can do about them. Uh, and I'm also not going to talk about viruses because that is uh, it's kind of a retro problem in a lot of ways. Um, it's uh, pretty far down the list, so I, I actually don't typically advocate most people to use antivirus software because it turns out that antivirus software is more of a liability, it exposes you more to potential risks and security vulnerabilities in a lot of ways um, than, than you're exposed to viruses. But there are some precautions you can take to uh, prevent viruses and it happens, those happen to also be precautions that uh, you should be taking anyway for all kinds of other security reasons. Um, so what I'd like to make sure everyone comes away with is a list of guidelines. We're going to go through this list in more detail, but I want to emphasize that security is first and foremost a skill. Uh, it's, a, it's a set of practices. It's something you have to practice every day and get better at. Uh, as technology and surveillance uh, keeps advancing, uh, those of us who would like to retain some privacy while using this technology are going to have to accept that we'll always be in sort of an arms race. Um, so these steps are the basic gist of the, the basic first steps you should do today. This is kind of 
you walk away, like, what should I do? Give me a checklist. Uh, you know, these are the things you should do. There's also a handful of good uh, online guides. There's uh, tact tacticaltech.org. Uh, has an eight-day digital data detox. I highly recommend that. Uh, they have you go through and audit your online presence and discover exactly what have you exposed, what's out there, what can other people discover, and how to get that data off the internet that you don't want out there. Um, set up, setting up a Google Alert for yourself is a good idea using Signal. That's a simple messaging app that is secure. I highly recommend everybody install that. It's free. Um, so, uh, highly recommended. Uh, Two-factor authentication, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, locking and encrypting all your devices using a password vault. Installing software updates, I know some people don't like doing that, but really keeping up to date is one of the best ways to stay secure, uh, better than antivirus software. Um, cover your camera when not in use. This is kind of, a, this is kind of getting into the tinfoil hat thing a little bit, maybe, but it's also cheap, it's free, and it's easy to do, and um, you know, I, I do it. Mark Zuckerberg does it. Should do it. It's it's easy. Um, and uh, and follow uh, follow the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the EFF, uh, for staying up to date because they are really an organization that is one of the best, you know, nonprofit organizations that is staying in touch with and on top of issues as they arise. Uh, and they're always arising, new things are coming up all the time. Uh, so we're going to talk about what is cybersecurity, uh, and, and then we're going to go into threat modeling, how to think about you know, how you are exposed and who might be interested in your data. And then, uh, then we're going to also talk through like how to protect yourself, some of the ways to protect yourself. Um, I, I want to uh, reemphasize that uh, even if you do everything I say here, you're not going to be 100% safe. There's always going to be ways that you're going to be exposed. And so everything you do online is a trade-off between uh, the convenience and the freedom of being able to do that and potentially putting yourself at risk. So I just want to make sure people are aware of that. The very first thing, though, is being aware of the risks uh, is, is the first step. Even if you can't do anything about it directly, at least you see them coming. Um, so that's that's really the first thing, and hopefully you you walk away with that. So the Merriam-Webster de de dictionary definition of cybersecurity is measures taken to protect a computer or computer system against unauthorized access or attack. This is a definition that's maybe a little bit more tailored toward companies or um, technical facilities, but I think it applies also to uh, everyday people. Um, because you know, measures taken, we're going to talk about how to encrypt and secure your data, and we're also going to take about, talk about how to have good online habits. Um, because because really, you know, the digital world is an extension of the social world of, of ourselves, of our mental life, of our uh, communications and relationships we have with other people. Um, but there's a lot that we don't see that we aren't aware of there. So um, it really starts with social practice. Um, and when we talk about computer and computer systems, we're talking obviously about phones and laptops and stuff, um, but we're also talking about stuff that exists in the cloud. We're talking about communications, social media and contacts, financial information, all of the things that, that happen that is sort of your, your digital footprint that exists out there. Um, so the basic strategy for any uh, approach to security is this four-step strategy. Understand the threats first. Uh, then make a plan. Uh, once you understand the threat, you can sort of figure out what you need to protect and what you need to be thinking about how, how somebody might try to go about getting your data. Um, make sure that the plan, it's important that it's, that it's simple, um, enough to follow on a consistent basis, that it's memorable, that you'll be able to remember exactly how to do it right, and that it's efficient, that it's not going to slow you down so much that you, that you throw it out. Right, uh, and then stick with the plan. You you really want to make sure that it is a thing that becomes a part of your daily routine and your daily habits. Right, if you decide, oh, I'm going to go in and I'm going to change all my passwords to be something really long and complicated, and then you forget them, uh, then you go and reset them to something simple. You know, it's like what's the point of having done that? So 
But the important thing is that, that it's whatever you come up with, that you stick with it, that it's something that you can keep up with. So threat modeling is kind of a, uh, it, it, the, the first step uh, in, in cybersecurity is it's thinking about what are the threats. Um, so that's who cares about your data, what capabilities and resources do they have, and how much are they willing to spend to get it. And the classical cybersecurity analysis, it's, it's really there's a cost-benefit trade-off that we talk about. So the, um, you know, you may have some, I don't know, some embarrassing teenage poetry that you wrote, say, on your laptop. And you don't want anybody to discover it because that would be really embarrassing for you. But Really, like you have to think about who, you know, who is really, who's really trying to get that information, right? It's probably not super valuable to, uh, you know, some hacker to get your teenage poetry and try to blackmail you with it. You know, it's like you're, you're pr at the end of the day, you're probably not going to spend too much to protect it, and they're not going to spend too much to try to get it. So the, um, you know. Spending a whole lot of time and money to try to protect that is not really a good trade-off. Uh, but so thinking in terms of how much is your opponent or your hacker uh, willing to spend um, is going to give you a good gauge of how much you should spend in terms of trying to protect your data. Um, so, you know, these are some very common things that we're going to talk about. This is sort of the sampling of the range of potential attacks that you might uh, be concerned about. Um, identity theft, uh, we'll talk about, you know, scamming and blackmail, this is all very personal stuff. Weaponization um, and DDoS is, is uh, maybe less personal. It's where uh, somebody installs malware on your machine and uses it to send out spam uh, emails or to send out coordinated distributed denial of service attacks against other machines. Um, without even you knowing that that's happening. Um, but when we're talking about your data, we're, we're interested in you know, identity theft, scamming, blackmail, uh, personal revenge, doxing, say somebody is mad at you or they, they, they are trying to go after you online and take you down. Um, one of the things that often happens is publishing of private information on the internet so somebody can harass you in your life. Um, and then you know, corporate abuse and government and police surveillance are, um, are very, you know, uh, increasingly important topics uh, because there are capabilities that are available to companies that are custodians of your data and governments and police forces that uh, can also, you know, that have even vaster resources at their disposal uh, to, um, to, to, find, to find you and, and uh, take advantage of you. So, First, we'll talk, we'll talk about the, the personal stuff, hacking and identity theft. Um, although, bear in mind that as we proceed from like the personal level out to the uh, government state level, everything that is a capability that a hacker, you know, some random hacker or some person that is trying to get revenge on you, every capability that they have, the government or the police or the state also has. So, um, everything we talk about here as personal security is going to be applicable at those bigger levels. <clears throat> in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, all of these famous companies have had major data breaches um, where you know, millions of customer uh, sensitive data has been leaked online, either through malicious hacking or through just sheer accident. Uh, in building secure systems, you know, the first rule of storing passwords is don't store passwords, right? You should companies theoretically building uh, login systems should not be storing plain text passwords or passwords that are easy to decrypt and yet they do it all the time and in fact um, in October 2016 Mozilla and the, the tactical tech org I mentioned earlier um, had a show at Glass Room in New York City uh, sorry the show was titled The Glass Room and they presented a book with the printed passwords of everybody who was, uh, whose password was exposed in the LinkedIn attack. Uh, and it turns out LinkedIn, you know, huge internet company was storing uh, plain text passwords, which is just unconscionable. And so, you know, you could go to this gallery, look up 
your password in this book, and uh, your chances are it was in there. And so everybody who had a password for LinkedIn, and they, if, they, if you were using that password for other sites, this is very common, a lot of times people will reuse a password because, okay, come up with one really good password and just use it on all the sites and just hope that you never get hacked. Well, this is kind of going to blow a hole in that plan, right? As soon as your password's out there, this becomes part of the dictionary that hackers trying to get into any of your accounts are going to automatically run through. So um, this just goes to show that like it, it's really hard to get a good password. Um, in fact, you know, uh, a few years ago, a whole bunch of Silicon Valley CEOs had their accounts hacked because their passwords were not good enough because they were reusing the same password on multiple sites, and one of the sites had a leak. So, uh, you know, Oculus uh, CEO, I think that uh, you know Zuckerberg was 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 caught. That uh, Uber CEO was was caught. Like really a bunch of really high level Silicon Valley types that should have known better did not have good account security, and so their their accounts were compromised. Um, and it turns out that it's really hard to do this by yourself. So, you know, we know we've seen these guidelines on different websites we signed up for, right? Strong passwords, they need to be random, they need to have a whole lot of characters and be long. Can't use dictionary words. Have to use a variety of characters, be kind of random. Uh, and you can't reuse it. So you have to have a whole bunch of random passwords that you have to somehow memorize. And then you have to change them all every six months or so, just in case there's, you know, uh, one of your accounts gets compromised. So there's really a lot of complexity that we're asking people to manage. And I, I think at this point that it is a little bit beyond uh, the scope of you know, what you can remember, especially if you're not going to write down your passwords on paper, which is also a bad idea. Um, so uh, you know, here's one approach that came out a few years ago called Correct Horse Battery Staple, uh, proposed by uh, a webcomic. XKCD, and it turns out that this is a this is a pretty good approach for most people to come up with secure passwords. Um, and this is showing, you know, uh, this is kind of the random character password that we talk about, which is it's sort of memorable. Okay, you take a dictionary word, and then you make a bunch of uh, substitutions to it, and you add some other random characters on the end, and you try, you know. Try to make a secure password that way, and I think that a lot of people have tried that. Um, it turns out that, that this is actually hard to remember and also fairly easy for computers to, uh, to, to guess, to break. Um, um, the correct horse battery staple approach is take four completely random dictionary words, you know, and then um, this will generate a very long password that is very easy to remember um, that it turns out is fairly hard to hack. And so this website, correcthorsebatteriestable.net, um, you can just hit a button and it will give you a random password uh, it, using this approach. And so um, this, is, this is one way, you know, free and fairly easy if you're going to keep generating your own passwords. Uh, I, I would recommend taking a look at this approach. It turns out it's not the most secure because now uh, password cracking algorithms are onto this approach, and so they will try, um, you know, using these these sort of random random word approach. Still pretty hard to crack, but it's a lot easier uh, than you would think, um, and especially once you're onto the idea that somebody is using this approach on multiple sites. So um, the thing that I I think is the best. Thing for people to do is get a password manager. Um, the best password managers are not completely free. Uh, one password is the one that I use. It's uh, three dollars a month for a subscription, um, which I think is more than worth it. Um, the the great thing about it is that it stores all of your passwords. It automatically generates completely random passwords that are super long, like 24 characters, with all kinds of you know random selections, and um, it, the only password you have to remember is your master password that, that you use to unlock your vault. Um, so, 
this seems like a single point of failure. Oh, what if somebody got your master password? Uh, well, it turns out that um, each time you have a new device, a new laptop, a new phone, and you want to log into that account, you also need to enter the master key, which is usually a QR code or some long string that you have to type in. Um, so unless that has been done on your device, if somebody gets your master password, it's not good enough. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and actually just demo uh, what that what that looks like in practice. Um, so I have it installed both in my uh, OS and as a browser extension, and I also have it in um, in, in uh, on my phone. So if I'm trying to get into my password vault, I just enter my master password. And then all of my logins are all saved. And it turns out that all of them are all different random passwords that are all pretty secure. Now, if I want to generate a new password, you know, there's no way I would ever remember a password this complex. No way. You know. And uh, it, it gives you a good gauge of exactly how long and complex it is. And guess what? It also does correct horse battery state, if that's something that you still want to do. Uh, and gives you a good estimate yeah, of, of how difficult it will be to crack, in this case with the green, green bar showing that it's going to be, it's going to take a really, really, really long time to ever uh, brute force attack that one. You can see the shorter um, the password is, the, uh, the less secure. Um, so, so anyway, so that's, that's kind of how I do it. And it, then, you know, it turns out that you can use this to store all kinds of data. So like, you know, I've got different um, keys in here that I need for different, different accounts that I have. I have like some credit cards that I use. Um, and so I, I use this pretty much as my single point of failure for, for all of my accounts. Um, and I, I don't know, I trust it. They don't store, uh, it's been audited independently. They, they don't store uh, the, your, any of your passwords in ways that could be recovered. Um, like they can't get your password back out. If you lose your master key, you're kind of hosed. Um, in fact, I would say a big red flag when I'm signing up for an online account is if you can get your password back from that company. You can click forgot password and they will email your password to you. That is that's terrible. That's a sign that they are storing your password in plain text and that if they got hacked, your password would be just, you know, it would be open season. So that's one password. There are a couple others. There's um, LastPass is another one that some people use. I don't like it as much. Um, there's KeePass X, which is free, but also is harder to set up. Um, uh, I just recommend looking into that. Next thing, two-factor authentication. So in addition to uh, your uh, having a strong password and using a lot of different passwords, uh, two-factor authentication is another step, another layer on top of just having a password that keeps somebody from logging into your account without your permission. Um, the slogan is something you have, something you know. So, right? so like, you know the password to your account. And if somebody else knows that thing, they could log into your account. But with two-factor authentication, they would also have to have your phone on them. Um, the basic idea of two-factor authentication, um, a lot of accounts enable this, is that, yeah, you, you enter your password, um, then you have you know, this app installed on your phone, uh, it's, this is also free to do. This uh, Google Authenticator. In Google Authenticator, this is set up with a bunch of my accounts. And you can see um, there's it generates random numbers, six-digit numbers, uh, for each account. And those numbers are only good for 90 seconds. So when I'm logging into my account, uh, it'll ask me what the number is for that account. And I'll have to type it in. Um, and so somebody that doesn't have my phone will not be able to get that account, or get that number within 90 seconds. There's no way they could brute force that. It's just not enough time. So um, so that's a pretty good, um, I highly recommend it. It's, it's 
it's not uh, too intrusive. It, it's still pretty efficient. Um, this is a case study. John Podesta from the DNC email hacks. It turns out that um, he got phished. And phishing is a specific kind of attack where somebody sends you an email pretending to be somebody they're not, somebody that maybe you trust, and tries to get you to go to a site that looks like a site that's real and ask you to enter your password somehow. And this is a way of getting your password or getting your secret information. It's essentially a mixture of a technical hack and also social engineering, right? Where they're basically lying. They're basically posing as somebody else uh, in order to get your trust. And so John Podesta at the DNC got this email. And um, the, uh, the problem is that he got this email. And it's obviously this, this like bit.ly link that set, asks to change the password. OK, so this is. If you click this link, it'll take you, who knows where, you know, probably a page that looks a lot like the Google page for resetting your password, but the URL, if you check it, is some other domain. Um, so, you know, that's that's the, the red flag, you know, giveaway that this is phishing, is that when, when it asks you to change your password or log in on a site that you don't trust or that you haven't seen before or that you don't know, you know, is the actual real domain. Well, it turns out that he wrote to, uh, his own IT staff about this email. He thought it was phishing. He asked his IT staff. They told him, you know, this is a legitimate email, right? This language, I think, confused him because he thought that it was that that meant that it was actually from Google. In fact, it what what they were trying to say was that this is a legitimate scam, right? Um, and so. Their advice was, you know, he needed to turn on two-factor authentication. He didn't have that. He needs to go to my account at google.com to reset his password, right? So he should have taken, he should have gone to actually gone to google.com to reset his password. Instead, he just went back to the scam, clicked on the link, and got his password and access to all the DNC emails. Shouldn't have done that, John. <laughs> so don't be like John Podesta. <laughs> don't click on email links. Just you know, as a general rule, just don't click on email links. If you, you know, if you get a, a, an email from Google or Facebook or whoever, just type it in. Go to Google.com and then figure out how to reset your password from there. Use your password manager for good, strong, random passwords. And you know, set up two-factor authentication. And then stuff like this, you know, it's a lot harder for this stuff to happen to you. Um, uh, so I, I want to also mention, you know, passwords aren't just for your online accounts. They're also for your computer, for your phone. Uh, so you should lock all of your devices that you have. Um, uh, if you um, have, uh, the great thing about Apple devices specifically is that they are uh, secure by default in terms of they, they have, they use full disk encryption. So uh, if somebody gets your laptop and your laptop is uh, locked by a secure password, um, it's as good as a brick to them. Uh, they won't be able to get into, uh, they won't be able to take the hard drive out and get at your data because it's all encrypted. Same thing with your phone. There was a whole big um, thing a few years ago with the, the uh, San Bernardino shooting that happened a few years ago um, where the FBI had access to an iPhone that was used by the shooter and they were trying to get Apple to give them a backdoor so that they could get at that data. And Apple refused, um, and eventually the, the FBI, you know, used the weight of its resources after several months to, uh, to 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 hire a guy who was able to eventually get it hacked. And I think that that involved a lot. I, th I think he he made like hundreds hundreds of thousands of copies of the the disk of the image of the phone, and then eventually brute forced his way in. But it took them a long time uh, to actually brute force into the phone. So. Uh, if you uh, are worried about the data on your phone, your, the messages that are in there, the, the photos that are in there, and you don't want uh, your phone to be taken, uh, as it can be if you get arrested, for instance, um, you should keep your phone locked. Um, so let's talk a little bit about doxers and blackmail. So um, doxing is like weaponized, personally identifiable information. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't spell out the acronym, but personally identifiable information is PII. And a lot of that's pretty easy to find. Um, 
you know, the, you have sites like whitepages.com and all these other uh, sites that are just kind of trolling around, and both social media and internet sites, and also um, public records, uh, tax documents, and this sort of thing. And they can come up with a lot of your personal information, and then they will just put it up online. And you know, are you looking for so and so? Are you looking for David Bowie? Here, find his records. You know, here's you know. And so a lot of times they will actually be able to put together a lot of information about your life that um, if somebody's looking to harm you, uh, they can find that as well. So, you know, first step is uh, is to probably go ahead and Google yourself today. Set up a Google alert for yourself today. So that you know what's out there, you know what people are able to find. That's like the first step. Second step, you know, lock down your social media accounts, set things to private that you don't want to be private, remove your phone number, your home address, and that sort of thing from your Facebook and your Twitter and all of your others, you know, LinkedIn and all of your social media accounts. Um, remove the PII you have control over. And then, you know, you, you actually can go into a lot of these sort of uh, uh, crawling sites. Uh, like whitepages.com. You can write them, it's a little bit of a hassle, but if you go through there, you can actually get them to remove your data most of the time. Um, the um, Tactical Tech 8-Day um, Digital Detox walks you through a lot of this, so I highly recommend that again. Uh, so, let's talk a little bit about like corporate privacy, which is the, the data that uh, that is yours that companies have that, you know, you have ultimately like our entire digital lives for the most part is privately owned. So you have companies that you entrust with your identity. You have Google, you have your Facebook, you have your Apple, you have your own, you know, all of these big companies, your Amazon. Um, so Google CEO Eric Schmidt uh, has this quote, it's more than a little creepy. Uh, we know where you are, we know where you've been. We can more or less know what you're thinking about. And anything that a company can uh, take advantage of in order to make a buck, they're probably going to do that. Uh, they're, they're, that's, I mean, that's capitalism, right? That's, there, there's nothing that is going to ultimately um, drive them to do the moral thing. <clears throat> and in fact, we've seen that happen. Um, in some high-profile high cases. A few years ago, Facebook was caught manipulating users' moods and um, uh, basically uh, trying to see this, this whole experiment. They didn't even make money directly off of this. They were just trying to see if they could do it, which is just to influence people's moods uh, based on what they show you in your Facebook feed. Um, and so uh, as big data and machine learning get um, become more advanced, we see that this sort of mass social manipulation can be used for all sorts of things. And I think that, you know, the, when we talk about the sort of fake news debate in uh, the, the election last year and, and this sort of stuff, um, I, I think that, you know, it, it, it's less uh, black and white than saying, oh, this, this, this news snippet is true or it's false, and it's more about the sentiment manipulation. It's more about, you know, what kind of data are they showing to what kind of people and to, for what end? Um, in 2012, back, way back in the day, Target um, sent uh, an advertisement to a teenage girl um, saying, you know, congratulations on your pregnancy and, you know, let Target, you know, sell you all these things for your baby and all this sort of stuff. Her parents didn't know she was pregnant. She hadn't told them yet. She hadn't told anybody yet. But Target guessed, based on her purchasing habits, uh, that she was pregnant and preemptively sent her this ad. Now, this is probably a little too obvious on their part. And what has happened in the meantime is that companies are getting more subtle and are operating in this sort of a gray area where it's not really, you know, like you're, you're, the, the world that you are shown online isn't really um, false, it's incomplete. It's only, you're, you're only seeing uh, information for the most part, if you're getting that through these big companies, you're only seeing the information that they are interested in showing you. And not necessarily for straightforward political reasons either. 
It's not like they're trying to advance only a, a partisan agenda. Uh, a lot of it is to keep you at coming back to their social media. Whatever keeps you logging into Facebook, whatever keeps you scrolling and arguing, arguing with people online, clicking links. Um, this is this is what they what they really want you to do. Is to, is to stay on their site. Uh, so this is something to be aware of. Uh, that's a security issue. That's not even a thing that you know. It's not as simple as changing your password. So if you're going to use these sites, you have to be aware uh, of this risk of this sort of psychological manipulation that you are uh, being shown a picture of reality that is that is distorted for uh, private profit ends. I have a question. Yes. So in the last slide, you were just talking about. I mean, I remember the, the Target uh, thing. And uh, you said that companies have become more subtle. Do you, is that because of the backlash, or because it's more effective to be subtle with, and so people don't actually know that you're <laughs> Yeah, both of those things, right? Because uh, the you know in, in this case there was a big back. Both of these cases there was a big backlash. You know, uh, Facebook was trying to keep this secret. You know, Target was actually didn't really care. Obviously, they sent her a, a mailer, an ad. And um, that was kind of obvious that they were uh, that they that they knew something and they were they were disclosing that. Facebook was trying to keep this a secret. They didn't really want people to know because this is bad PR for them. <coughs> um, and so, you know, now it, it it is more subtle because you know a, this is very common. You talk about in, in app development, even for smaller scale companies, you talk about you know A/B testing, for instance, is where you take some one group of users and you show them one thing and a different group of users and show them a different thing and see which um, which thing people interact with more. You know, so it could be like one kind of website design versus another kind of website design. And you're trying to trying to figure out which one is, is easier to use. And a lot of times this kind of thing is very benign, uh, but it is a low key form of this sort of you know what gets more clicks. You know, um, so. When you have companies like as big as Facebook, with their just you know massive scale of data that they have at their disposal, uh, they are able to run these sorts of experiments on a very targeted level for all kinds of people. Um, so that, that gets into my next slide, which is just that uh, the big data uh, big data is a big, is, is a, is a big uh, topic right now. Uh, for good reason, because machine learning is opening up new kinds of data that were not previously available. And in fact, they are able to um, computationally derive a lot of stuff that you don't even tell them necessarily. right? So we saw that with the, with the target thing, uh, that young woman had not told them uh, that she was pregnant, and yet they derived that based on her patterns, based on uh, matching her, uh, um, automatically grouping her with other people who had similar spending patterns and saying, well, most of these people are pregnant, so she's probably pregnant. Uh, and so they're able to do that with all kinds of stuff. There was a thing, uh, an instance of like, I think Facebook decided that people who like curly fries on Facebook are more intelligent. And it's not because <laughs> liking curly fries makes you intelligent. It's because the people who liked curly fries you know, maybe somebody originally set up a page, like a meme page about curly fries or something, and, and it became popular among a certain social circle. And so this sort of seemingly unrelated interests will betray completely other things that maybe you're not wanting to disclose, like your LGBTQ status, if you're, you know, if, if, you, if you aren't out of the closet, if you're not, like, sharing that information with everybody, maybe there's some people you don't want to know that. Or, you know, your political or your religious beliefs, these, you know, uh, things that are, things that are, a lot of times, you know, private health conditions, you know, your mood or your mental state. Um, uh, again, you know, the, going back to the Eric Schmidt, we can know what you're thinking a lot of the time. Um, and so, um, that's that's another thing to be aware of. It's just like it's not just about what you have explicitly told these companies. It's about what they are able to figure out from what you've told them that may be seemingly unrelated. Um, so, you know, the, the, the main approach to this is like, well, what can you do? Spend less time on Facebook, probably, to start. Uh, you know, um, although, you know, I haven't deleted my account. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if everybody is willing to take that step. I stay in touch with a lot of people, and I keep up to date with a lot of things. It's a useful thing. But 
I'm more conscious about what I what I say on there, what I share. Um, delete unused apps on your phone. Delete stuff that you know posts and and data that you don't find serve you. Um, and the Facebook and Epi Messenger apps specifically on your phone, uh, I don't install those. So like when I last time I got a new phone, I just never installed the Messenger app or the Facebook app because they ask for all kinds of device permissions and I don't I don't trust them. It's not that I know they're doing something wrong, I don't trust them. Um, because I think they're, you know, I don't have proof, but they do track your location a lot. They, they use the camera, they use the microphone to listen to you, to, um, to watch what you're doing. So they're collecting as much data as they can reasonably get their hands on for these purposes. So I just I just keep them off my phone altogether. It's, it doesn't completely keep me safe, but it's one step. Um, so, you know, these are all things that companies can do, and they're also things that you know governments can do. And in fact, you know, Facebook, in their terms of service, they reserve the right to share any and all of your data that you have on Facebook with the police, with state, you know, actors, and with governments. Uh, so if you're doing something that you think that the police might be interested in, don't put it on Facebook, right? Because that is going to, you might as well just give it to the police. So, um, just a brief overview, you know, the USA Patriot Act kind of gave uh, NSA and FBI um, extra rights they didn't have before. Um, and, you know, in what? 2007, they got even more rights. Snowden, Edward Snowden, this guy, remember him, uh, revealed that the NSA and the FBI were doing way more than that. Even. Uh, so uh, a, a lot of this stuff, this was a talk a few years ago about your metadata. So like, let's say you encrypt all of your messages, right? And so nobody can read the contents of your messages. Well, they can still see the metadata, who you're talking to, where you are, you know, um, and and when you're talking to them, and it turns out that from this sort of data, you can build a pretty good network about, you know, who is talking to who, who is related to who, and what's going on in these activities. And you don't really even have to read the content of that message to know that something's up. Um, so one way of keeping, uh, you know, keep keeping a uh, those eyes away, you know, uh, keeping your metadata secret, you know, for instance, uh, your, your, your web browsing activity, you know, let's say you're using HTTPS on everything, well, uh, they can't read the contents of those web pages, but they can still see that you're visiting this or that web page. So uh, Tor is a tool to get around that. The Tor browser, it's free to download. Um, it, don't use it for everything, every day. Number one, it's slow. Uh, number two, it is no good if you're logging into anything with your identity. Just don't do it. Um, but it's pretty good. Uh, for instance, there was, the, I think, the Protect J20 website that was um, came under scrutiny from the FBI about, you know, they subpoenaed, I think the Jeff Sessions Justice Department subpoenaed the list of everybody who had visited this website. Like millions of people had visited this website. And they wanted to know who they were. So, like, what are you? What, what is the? What is the FBI going to do with that information? You're right. You have a bunch of people who are protesting the inauguration of a deeply unpopular president, and you know, the, uh, the, the all of a sudden the FBI wants to know who is trying to protest. So, um, you know, if, but if, if if you had visited that website through Tor, as long as you didn't type in any of your personal information, you would have been protected. Um, I think for the things that are really sensitive data, you know, compartmentalized identity is something to start thinking about, which is just having uh, completely separate email accounts, devices, um, you know, uh, uh, all the sort of things. Um, that's, that's like a whole, that's a whole rabbit hole to go down. I'm just going to touch on that right now, but um, it's something to think about looking into if you're doing sensitive things. Um, so, you know, again, with the metadata, they don't even need your name to identify you. Uh, it turns out that 
87% of the U.S. population can be identified based on five digit zip code, gender, and date of birth, right? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, I live in 98122, and my date of birth is April 17, 1979. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm male, so like, how many other people have those date details in common? So like, you can get a lot of identifying information based on very little data, actually, and then, what you can do is you can you can use that that metadata to then track somebody. So you can see, well, most of us, most of the time, we're going from uh, home to school or home to work and back. Um, but deviations from those patterns um, really stick out. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to just breeze through these things. Police have all kinds of tools at their disposal nowadays that don't even involve spying on your devices. Um, uh, stingrays can see what phones are in an area. Um, there are uh, facial recognitions and license plate cameras everywhere um, that are tracking kind of you know faces and license plates. They can see where your car has been, where you've been. Um, that uh, and you know, but it doesn't help that your phone is also a, basically a tracking device. Um, the uh, yeah, I, I talked already about the San Bernardino shooter's phone, um, but you know, if you're going to protest, if you if you think you might be arrested, if you're you know, the, the smartest thing to do is just basically always have your phone locked, um, because the police are going to try to get any information they can off of your phone. Uh, so most phones are automatically encrypted. Uh, iPhones, I think Androids now are are uh, encrypted. Lock them with a passcode, not a fingerprint, because if you're uh, because they can coerce you to put your finger on the phone, but they can't coerce you to type in your passcode. And it's, it's locked away. So um, you can also enable auto wipe and remote wipe on your phone so, um, and, and your laptop. So if, if it does fall out of your hands, you can wipe, out, wipe that data off so that they won't have a chance to get at it. Uh, think about temporary burner phones if you need to make a bunch of calls in a short uh, period of time. Don't use it for too long. Get rid of it. You can usually get them for like, yeah, like 15 to 30 bucks. Um, and you know this takes me to Signal, which is just basically everyday messaging um, is very insecure for text messages, SMS uh, is going over cell networks. Um, Signal goes over uh, the internet, and it is end-to-end -end encrypted, which means that from the minute you hit enter to type your message, it gets encrypted. Signal never sees the contents beyond that first layer. It gets sent down through the um, sent over through the wire. Uh, in that completely encrypted form, and only a person that you trust at the other end is able to decrypt it. So Signal is how you want to uh, use text messaging from now on. If you are um, going to be making plans with people uh, of any kind, in fact, you know, um, one of the best ways to be secure is not make, it, make security an exception, make it the norm. So I use Signal for all of my text messaging that I can nowadays. Even if I'm just asking what groceries to get or whatever, it's not um, it's it's not um, it's not hard to use. It's easy, to, you know. Once you get it set up, it's it's really simple. Uh, so I I'm going to skip over tour and social stuff and just get to the end here. Um, so the rules of thumb: you know, avoid the single points of failure, share passwords, and so on. Um, Remember that security is a practice, not a product. It's something you have to practice as a habit. Um, and uh, don't overshare, you know, what, whatever, don't put out stuff out there that you don't need out there. And then, you know, we're, we're all criminals now, basically. Under the current government regime, uh, they don't need a probable cause anymore to, in order to, to investigate you. So uh, just assume you're under investigation, you probably are. Uh, here's some more resources. I can send this out or I can hand this off to somebody um, if you want or interested in further reading. Uh, uh, I highly recommend um, continuing. This is a very big topic. I know it covered a lot of information uh, very briefly. Uh, I hope it was useful to you. I appreciate any and all feedback. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I would recommend the class pass, but haven't they had like more than one major security breach in recent years? I, I'm not a huge fan of LastPass. Yeah. So, yeah. so one password is my favorite. Uh, 
I don't know about the security breaches from last pass, though. That's good to I, know. I might also like sticky password. Uh, okay. Also, which is free on a freemium model. You have to pay to synchronize your passwords, but you don't have to pay to use it all together. Oh, that's cool. Sticky password. I, okay. Yeah, I would. I honestly have serious reservations about synchronizing my passwords all together, mm -hmm. even if it is officially a zero knowledge company, because regardless of what's protecting your passwords, when you store it in a pool with hundreds of thousands or millions of other people, you're never really putting like crosshairs. Mm -hmm. There are never really more of a target right? mm -hmm. would be attackers, regardless of what's protecting. Well, uh, just a couple of things. I think uh, if you're using the Tor browser, I know that Google would block it and you know, would not like give any you know results to your searches that you've been using Tor. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, you know, I, I think uh, in January maybe of this year, you know, in Seattle there was you know um, um, a household which had posted like a Tor node, mm -hmm. and you know the the cops just you know broke into their house, you know, and started that you know they had a child. Pornography, you know, um, through their computers, which you know, it was not. It was, you know, like they were hosting a, a dog node. So it's, it's sometimes you know kind of dangerous to you know do that um, because you know you, you will you know get um, you will you know you will um, invite suspicion from from you know from the cops and you know. And um, I you know I was thinking about the point that you made about uh, you know. Um, Surveillance from Google and you know surveillance from the government. That's like two separate things from like state actors. Mm -hmm. I feel like you know there is a false dichotomy between that. Mm -hmm. You know they are like part. You know they are like one composite. You know where Google gets a lot of uh, government. You know uh, contracts. You know to you know do research. Um, you know for different and you know other things. And you know then the government you know uses Google. You know um, work is like you know. And NSA and you know, other things stronger. So yeah. I feel like you know, they are like you know they are like one big composite you know, acting like different. Areas. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with that. You know, I think that, you know, especially for the bigger companies, you can you consider anything that you have on one of those bigger company accounts to be uh, might as well be in the government's hands. So I totally agree with that. Other people might have questions, but I want to recognize that folks may need to leave, and I want to thank our presenters, so please join me in thanking Dave. If you have a little bit of time, people still have questions, can they, can they ask you? Yeah, I'll be around. I have another half hour, so I can be here, so uh, anybody that has questions here, you want to know. And I can post And I can post these resources on the library's lib guide. Um, if you need help getting to that, the cozy look guide, you can just go to the reference desk and show you exactly how to get to it. And the recording for the session will be on there too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you recommend for, 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 for privacy.